um, where we're looking at Manfred by Byron, a uh, dramatic poem. Uh, I want to look at it um, as an illustration of Byron's, um, one of the early presentations of Byron's hero, somewhat like himself, in, in, the, uh, in, his, in his poetry. Uh, it, it presents a very uh, bleak, troubled character, idealistic, oppressed. Um, we have sympathy for him. He's defiant of tyranny. So he represents a sort of a, he's a freedom fighter. Uh, in a sense, um, as I say, Milton Satan could be a good figure for this insofar as if you see God as the morally inferior figure and Satan as the morally superior figure, which is how the second generations of, of romantics read this. They didn't really see it as a work of theology, or if it was that you know, Milton's theology was to be taken less seriously than his work of poetry. Let's, let's, so sheared of the theology, this is a, a work against tyranny, uh, against oppressive rule. And they read it that way, and it was read that way even all the way into the Arab Spring. Interestingly, I read that Paradise Lost was being read as a, as a sort of a model of revolt against tyranny, God being the tyrant then. So it's just a way, a, a metaphorical way of reading the text and applying it to a different context and so forth. And that would be a very romantic way of reading Milton. Let's not take him too literally. His theology, we can dispense with that, but he presents a grand resistance to the tyranny of heaven. This is how Satan himself represents it. Satan, of course, is vilified as the villain, um, yet he's morally superior to God, at least according to Shelley. Uh, because we only see his oppression, we don't see what happens before it, uh, etc. Anyway, uh, this is Byron's dramatic poem, Manfred, uh, cites Hamlet at the outset. There are more things in heaven and earth. Horatio then are dreamt of in your philosophy and um, presents it in a three-act play. Now, as a play, it's not a perform. it's a stage, it's a uh, closet drama not meant to be performed. The Romantics write a series of these. Uh, and in general, this is a very non, um, in terms of the, the Romantic movement in general is a period which you almost see no work in terms of plays. Novels abound, poetry abounds, but no plays of fr from the main writers of the period. That's interesting. Uh, and it does seem to reflect that r the romantic heroism is more of an internal thing rather than external thing. They do side with the French Revolution and the political actions there, but they see it as more than a political revolt. It's more of a spiritual revolt. And, and you could draw analogies between that and a Christian understanding of uh, engagement with the principalities and powers of the world. It's more of a, a spiritual rebellion except they're not really seeing it in Christian terms. They are seeing it as a reframing of society in terms of a, a whole worldview. That I do think is, is happening in this period. There's a reframing of, uh, of all of life in terms of the postulates of autonomy. So the individual self who is rebelling against all forms of authority which it posits as false, because the only true authority lies within oneself. So it doesn't matter if it's the, if it's the church or the state or the family or any form, really, or the, or the father figure even within that. Uh, all authority that resides outside of yourself is, is a imposition on you, and you ought to overthrow it. So there's an, an intellectual... Uh, stripping away of the all trappings of authority outside yourself. All things that you have not granted your assent to be ruled by are illegitimate. 
because it starts with the Cartesian self. You establish your own legitimacy by, by thinking and feeling, and everything that's imposed upon you by society is uh, ipso facto illegitimate. And when it imposes, says you have to follow these rules, where is the authority of the state in this? It, does it have any legitimate authority? And they appeal to nature to justify their autonomous selves and present themselves as heroic defenders of conscience, of their own uh, blessed feelings about things. And we, we, it's repeated. And they also, in general, now it's not true of, of, of Byron here, but it is true of the Romantics in general, they tend to appeal to human life as an organic, as an organism, rather than using the Christian terminology of personhood. And that's not insignificant. Oh, this is a great time to do this. The thunder, I hope that's picked up on the thing. Mood, setting. Maybe the lights will crash. No, it'll be really cool. Um, yeah, but that's part of the landscape for, for Byron. Oh, and its setting is in the Alps. Gothic gallery, oh, scene. A Gothic gallery, time, midnight. Uh, what else did we have just before that? Oh, it doesn't say. It does in my text, however. The scene of the drama is amongst the higher Alps, partly in the castle of Manfred and partly in the mountains. So he, he is set there, and it says there's a Chamonix in terms of the dramatis personae. Oh, I'd have to go backwards with this. They were there at the beginning. A chamois hunter, the abbot of St. Maurice, Manuel, Herman, witch of the Alps, Arimanes, and Nemesis, the destiny, spirits, etc. Oh, there it's where it says it is. Um, the chamois, this is in Switzerland, in other words, in the Alps, and specifically very close to Mont Blanc. And Mont Blanc is the highest mountain in Europe, and it's a sublime landscape. It, it, it is the quintessential sublime landscape. People go on pilgrimages from all over Europe to see Mont Blanc, and one of the reasons they do it is because they are deists and perceive something of the awesome nature of uh, God in this particular natural landscape. The, the mountain goes up into the clouds. There are ice fields, it's, it's in the middle of glaciers, that are not yet melted. So it suggests an earlier age and yet, yet that spirit still plays on. <coughs> and uh, Arimanes is a, is a spirit, um, a spirit of darkness. Uh, it's very much of an, a dualistic uh, Manichaean worldview. Uh, same in Shelley's poetry. Arimanes is like the storm god and uh, represents evil. Um, and, and in both men's writing, you get the sense that um, they, are, they are sort of going to a pre-Christian worldview that would be in keeping with um, uh, a Nietzschean idea. Um, Nietzsche appeals to the same sort of dualistic light and darkness at war in the world and it looks like evil is winning. And remember I said to you that for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, it was written during the year without a summer in which there were not just crop failures, but there was ice and snow falling in the middle of the summer. And so it naturally just like, the, like outside where we hear the thunder and rain, but imagine that all the time and snow falling in the summer, it, it seems like um, ice and cold, which since Dante represents evil, um, prevailing. And, there, and Napoleon's just been defeated. And the principalities and powers of this world, namely the states of Europe, are met in the Council of Vienna and decide they're gonna divide up the states of Europe and, and uh, maintain their order and prevent further revolutions. So it looks like the good has won on the political level, but on the, on the natural level, it looks like there's a, revol a revolt of nature against political power. And they lean into that. 
in their in their writing and this little cr closet drama builds on that and as i say the setting is the alps now as i say mont blanc is a sublime landscape because it, the grandeur of the alp is it's so vast that in the presence of that vast mountain you feel like you are going to be destroyed you feel puny and insignificant you feel the, the you you apprehend the power of the mountain and your relative mortality in relation to it. That's part of the whole sublime experience. And you note that there's no uh, compassion. The elements sh show no mercy towards you. So Manfred alone seen a Gothic gallery. Well, of course it's Gothic. Time midnight. Manfred. The lamp must be replenished, but even then it will not burn so long as I must watch. My slumbers, if I slumber, are not sleep, but a continuance, a continuance of enduring thought, which then I can resist, I can resist not. In my heart there is a vigil, and these eyes but close to look within. And yet I live and bear the aspect and the form of breathing men. But grief should be the instructor of the wise. Sorrow is knowledge. They who know the most must mourn the deepest or the fatal truth. The tree of knowledge is not that of life. Philosophy and science and the springs of wonder and the wisdom of the world I have essayed and in my mind there is a power to make these subject to itself. But they avail not. I have done men good, and I have met with good even among men, but this availed not. I have had my foes, and none have baffled, many fallen before me, but this availed not. Good or evil, life, powers, passions, all I see in other beings, have been to me as rain unto the sands since that all nameless hour. I have no dread and feel the curse to have no natural fear, nor fluttering throb that beats with hopes or, or wishes or lurking love of something on the earth. Now to my task. Mysterious agency, ye spirits of the unbounded universe, whom I have sought in darkness and in light, ye who do compass earth about and dwell in subtler essence, ye to whom the tops of mountains inaccessible are haunts and earths and oceans, caves, familiar things. I call upon ye by the written charm which gives me power upon you. Rise, appear. They come not yet. Humor. Byron has humor in him. Wordsworth has not. Coleridge, none. Byron has a sense of humor. So there's a, you can imagine this grand scheme. You have this, this uh, projected genius figure, defiant, calling upon powers, and they, nothing happens. Like Gandalf, when he tries to do a spell and it doesn't work. You know, he tries to open the door, the gate of, right? Well, I just have to say the spell and, you know, and then he, he makes a big loud incantation and nothing. And then the hobbits are, you know, didn't work. And he's, you know, you know, ang right. the, I think Byron's really good with this. So there's a little bit of sense of um, self parody in it, which you can't imagine Wordsworth ever having. He takes himself too seriously. But in Byron here, so nothing, they come not yet. Now, by the voice of him who is the first among you, by this sign which makes you tremble, by the claims of him who is undying, rise, appear, appear. A pause. If it be so, spirits of earth and air, ye shall not this thus elude me by a power deeper than all yet urged, a tyrant spell which had its birthplace in a star condemned, the burning wreck of a demolished world, a wandering hell in the eternal space, by the strong curse which is upon my soul, the thought which is within me and around me, I do compel ye to my will. Appear!
A star is seen at the darker end of the gallery. It is stationary and a voice is heard singing. Okay, so it works. I w would also submit that one of the texts that we need to see in the backdrop of this is Dr. Faustus. And the, the myth of Dr. Faustus. Uh, let me just say something about Faustus, uh, just a little bit. Uh, there is something called, um, in the, the period of the Reformation, there was a figure called Faust, who appears to have been a real figure, um, who seems to have been involved in something like um, black magic, something like that. Uh, theology that is ad apparent, apparent, um, um, heretical in some ways. And, and Luther writes against him, Melanchthon mentions him and so forth, and a whole Faust book ar arises, uh, compilation, and, that, and this figure of Faust is then attributed and, and, and basically connected to all sorts of other magi. Paracelsus and Cornelius Agrippa and so forth, mentioned in Frankenstein as well. And these figures are connected with the Faust book. And the Faust book then becomes like a, a text that is referred to by Christo Christopher Marlowe in his book, Dr. Faustus. And then he becomes a figure that is tempted by the devil. The devil then gets brought into it, not in the Faust book, but by Marlowe, and he's tempted with knowledge and the knowledge to do certain things. And there's a little pact with the devil and all that, Mephistopheles and all that, which then becomes picked up by, by Goethe and, and others. But it's there very early on. And I think that, that uh, Byron was uh, corresponding with Goethe, who was an admirer of, of Byron, very much so, and vice versa. And he had probably read the first uh, book of uh, Goethe's Faust. And so I think there's something of that in the figure of Manfred as well. There is a sort of a Faustian figure here making a, uh, a sort of a, uh, an alliance with dark spiritual powers. I think that lies in the background here. And the setting suggested as well in, in as I say, it's in, the, it's in the, a Gothic setting. A Gothic, uh, we associate with the Goths of the medieval Germanic, I mean, obviously it's in Switzerland. And we associate that with Gothic horror. All of those things are here in, their, in the age. But at any rate, at the end of this, a star is heard singing. First spirit, mortal, to thy bidding bowed from my mansion in the cloud, which the breath of twilight builds and the summer's sunset gilds with the azure and vermilion, which is mixed for my pavilion. Though thy quest may be forbidden, on a star beam I have ridden, to thine adjuration bowed, mortal, be thy wish avowed. Voice of the second spirit. Mont Blanc is the monarch of mountains. They crowned him long ago, on a throne of rocks in a robe of clouds with a diadem of snow. Around his waist are forests braced, the avalanche in his hand. But ere it fall, that thundering ball must pause for my command. The glacier's cold and restless mass moves onward day by day. Fantastic. But I am he who bids it pass, or with its ice delay. I am the spirit of the place, could make the mountain bow and quiver to his cavern base. And what with me wouldst thou? Third spirit, third spirit, fourth spirit, fifth spirit, sixth spirit, all the same uh, general import. Spirits of power, spirits of darkness associated with the mountain where Aramanes dwells, spirits of destruction, and yet his spirit has mastered them and brought them under his command in some way. And then the seven spirits speak together. I'm just going to skip over this because we don't have... Uh, Earth, ocean, air, night, mountains, winds, thy star are at thy beck and bidding, child of clay. Before thee at thy quest their spirits are. What wouldst thou with us, son of mortals, say? So Adam means clay, red clay. 
Byron is, uh, if nothing else, an extraordinarily literate man, um, knows his languages as well. Biblical terminology, he's, exp he's, he's conscious of it, he's read it, um, and he's deviating from it uh, intentionally. He'll, he'll do it even more strongly in Cain, a mystery. I, I deal with that in uh, a different course. I'm not going to do Cain here, but he, he replays uh, the Garden of Eden and what happens there. Um, and anyway, that's for a, a separate course. But again, very interested in the account of Scripture and yet wants to move in explicitly heretical directions with it. What does he want from this? Forgetfulness. Okay. Not what you would expect. He doesn't want power. He's not like Goethe's Faust. He's not making a pact. He is, in a sense, wanting to forget. What does he want to forget? Well, he w if it's Byron, you might think of many things he might want to forget. And those are, believe me, those are going to get dragged in here. As I say, there's a reason why Byron, al people always think that Byron is being putting himself into his poetry. Well, that's because he always is, at least dallying with it, which just increases his reputation. He's infamous in this sense. Forgetfulness. Of what? Of whom? And why? Of that which is within me. Read it there. Ye know it, and I cannot utter it. We can but give thee that which we possess. Ask of us subjects, sovereignty, the power or earth, the whole or portion, or a sign which shall control the elements, whereof we are the dominators, each and all. These shall be thine. Oblivion, self-oblivion, can ye not wring from out the hidden realms ye offer so profusely what I ask? It is not in our essence, in our skill, but thou mayest die. Will death bestow it on me? We are immortal and do not forget. We are eternal and to us the past is, as the future, present. Art thou answered? Ye mock me. But the power which brought ye here may, hath made you mine. Slaves, scoff not at my will. The mind, the spirit, the Promethean spark, the lightning of my being is as bright, pervading, and far darting as your own, and shall not yield to yours, though cooped in clay. Answer, or I will teach you what I am. We answer as we answered. Our reply is even in thine own words. Why say ye so? If, as thou sayest, thine essence be as ours, we have replied in telling thee the thing mortals call death hath not to do with us. I then have called ye from your realms in vain. Ye cannot or ye will not aid me. Say, what we possess we offer. It is thine. Bethink ere thou dismiss us. Ask again kingdom and sway and strength and length of days accursed what have i to do with days they are too long already hence be gone yet pause being here our will would do thee service bethink thee is there then no other gift which we can make not worthless in thine eyes no none so note Although he's a sort of a satanic hero and, and he represents a sort of a spirit of um, rebellion, he doesn't desire what Satan desires. He doesn't desire power. He doesn't desire domination. He, it's a different. So he, he casts the Byronic hero as, yes, evil, but evil is not evil connected with the, the base parts of Satan, which is his desire for rule, absolute dominion, just like Sauron is in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It's not that sort of thing. So unexpected connections. We'll find the same thing is true of Shelley. Shelley will do exactly the same thing. And in a sense, he, he's doing what we also saw with Mr. Blake at the beginning, which is to present evil as good and good as evil. So the figures that represent goodness, the, the authorities, the church, the state, 
the, the head of family, etc. These are actually uh, evil, even though they call themselves good, and those that they disparage actually are probably freedom fighters defending the good. So they, they, it's just a role reversal. And the defiance is then a heroic thing and not a, um, as Milton would present it, a, a, an, an evil action. But that's because there is no legitimacy, legitimacy outside of the self. There is no legitimacy. They, they depend on the enlightenment notion of autonomy at all times. And so you, you really need to think about the importance of autonomy as a postulate of the Enlightenment and how strongly or how legitimately it actually holds true of human nature. Are we actually autonomous? Is this the best way of understanding human nature? And for my part, I don't think it is. I don't think that children have the power of autonomy. And I think that there is such a thing as legitimate authorities even when they contradict their legitimacy by not acting as they ought to. There's still a legitimacy that comes with, with, with the church, with the state, with families, with the heads of families, etc. Even though they often don't do as they ought to do, there's still a legitimacy and a goodness in that. It creates an order. Um, none of these men will agree with that. So a strong anti-authoritarian impulse and so strong that they oppose all forms of authority outside their own and this then becomes exemplary for everyone else and they present the orphan as the model figure of this sort of her heroism for the rest of us is there nothing we can do no, none. Yet stay. One moment, ere we part, I would behold ye face to face. I hear your voices, sweet and melancholy sounds, as music on the waters, and I see the steady aspect of a clear, large star, but nothing more. Approach me as ye are, or one, or all, in your accustomed forms. We have no forms beyond the elements of which we are the mind and principle. But choose a form in that we will appear. I have no choice. There is no form on earth hideous or beautiful to me. Let him who is most powerful of ye take such aspect as unto him may seem most fitting. Come, seventh spirit, appearing in the shape of a beautiful female figure. Behold, O oh God, if it be thus, and thou art not a madness and a mockery, I might, I might be most happy. I will clasp thee, and we again will be. The figure vanishes. My heart is crushed. <laughs> it's hard for me not to. <laughs> anyway, Manfred falls senseless. Now, voice is heard in the incantation which falls. So now we have an incantation. When the moon is on the wave, and the glowworm in the grass, and the meteor on the grave, and the wisp on the morass, when the falling stars are shooting, and the answered owls are hooting, and the silent leaves are still in the shadow of the hill, shall my soul be upon thine with a power and with a sign. Though thy slumber may be deep, yet thy spirit shall not sleep. There are shades which will not vanish. There are thoughts thou canst not banish. By a power to thee unknown, thou canst never be alone. Thou art wrapped as with a shroud. Thou art gathered in a cloud. And forever shalt thou dwell in the spirit of this spell. Though thou seest me not pass by, Thou shalt feel me with thine eye, as a thing that, though unseen, must be near thee, and hath been. And when in that secret dread thou hast turned round thy head, 
Thou shalt marvel, I am not as thy shadow on the spot, and the power which thou dost feel shall be what thou must conceal. And a magic voice and a verse hath baptized thee with a curse, and a spirit of the air hath begirt thee with a snare. In the wind there is a voice shall forbid thee to rejoice, and to thee shall night defy all the quiet of her sky. And the day shall have a sun which shall make thee wish it done. From thy false tears I did distill an essence which hath strength to kill. From my own heart I then did ring from the, the, the black blood in, thy, in its blackest spring. From my own smile I snatched the snake. For there I coiled it as in a break. With, from my own lip I drew the charm which gave all these their chiefest harm. In proving every poison known, I found the strongest was thine own. By thy cold breast and serpent smile, by thy unfathomed gulfs of guile, by that most seeming virtuous eye, by that shut soul's hypocrisy, by the perfection of thine art which passed for human thine own heart, by thy delight in others' pain, and by the brotherhood of Cain, I call upon thee and compel thyself to be thy proper hell. And on thy head I pour the vial which doth devote thee to this trial, nor to slumber, nor to die, shall be in thy destiny. Though thy death shall still seem near to thy wish, but as a fear, lo, the spell now works around thee, and the clankless chain hath bound thee, or thy heart and brain together hath the word been passed, now whither? So, this is a, uh, an incantation which comes from a voice, not Manfred's. And it's a sort of an a, a incantation that puts a spell over, over him then. So that's the conclusion of uh, Act 1, Scene 1. In Act 1, Scene 2, we have the, the mountain of the Jungfrau. Now, Jungfrau is the virgin. And it's one of the mountains in the Alps there. Um, famous uh, ski mountain. Um, time now is morning. It was midnight, remember, before. Now we've reached the morning the next day, so the light is up. Man uh, sunlight. Manfred is alone upon the cliffs at the end of that dark night of the soul. Now, um, Manfred, the spirits I have raised abandon me. The spells which I have studied baffle me. The remedy I wrecked of tortured me. I lean no more on superhuman aid. It hath no power upon the past. And for the future, till the past be gulfed in darkness, it is not of my search. My mother, earth, and thou remember he's a Promethean figure, so he's come from the earth. Um, my mother earth, and thou fresh breaking day, and you, ye mountains. Remember, Arimanes is, this, is the spirit of frost and ice in the, in the high mountains, but the earth is a, is a different, more domestic and more uh, serene figure. Why, why are ye beautiful? I cannot love ye. And thou, the bright eye of the universe that openest over all, and unto all art a delight, thou shines not on my heart. And you, ye crags, upon whose extreme edge I stand, and on the torrent's brink beneath, behold, the tall pines dwindled as to shrubs in dizziness of distance, when a leap, a stir, a motion, even a breath, would bring my breast upon its rocky bosom's bed. So, he, bed. so he's right on the edge of the precipice. All he needs to do is be moved by a wind, and he's, he's dead. So he's sitting there right on the edge of death. To rest forever, and you've probably seen that figure, um, famous um, painting by Caspar David Friedrich. This one, which is often presented in romantic uh, Die Landschaft der Seele. 
or very romantic. So this is a very romantic poem, or a romantic poem, Zustimmen. Very romantic landscape. The individual, his back to us, his face doesn't matter, he's looking out into the abyss and, and defying the grandeur, the sublime grandeur of what he beholds, and he is greater than it because he beholds in his mind the grandeur that's out there, and he uh, has the capacity to perceive its sublimity, which is, it, in itself it lacks because it is only a natural landscape, but he perceives something greater than it in it. So he masters it in that sense. And that's what Goethe is, uh, or Goethe, Byron is expressing here. And it's, con it's throughout the period. Now, th this is how Kant perceives the sublime to be. It's the capacity to perceive that grandeur, which is, it, which is the sublime. It's not an experience that's out there. The mountain is not sublime. Our capacity to perceive something greater than the mountain is what is sublime. So it's our imaginative powers, if that makes sense. And rest forever. Wherefore do I pause? I feel the impulse, yet I do not plunge. I see the peril, yet do not recede. And my brain reels. And yet my foot is firm. There is a power upon me which withholds and makes it my fatality to live. If it be life to wear within myself this barrenness of spirit and to be my own soul's sepulcher, for I have ceased to justify my deeds unto myself, the last infirmity of evil. I, thou winged and cloud-cleaving minister and eagle passes, whose happy flight is highest unto heaven, well mayst thou swoop so near me, I should be thy prey and gorge thine eaglets. Thou art gone, where the eye cannot follow thee, but thine yet pierces downward, onward, or above, with a pervading vision. Beautiful. How beautiful is all this visible world. How glorious in its action and itself. Sounds like Hamlet here. But we who name ourselves its sovereigns, we, half dust, half deity, alike, unfit to sink or soar, and with our mixed essence make a conflict of its elements, and breathe the breath of degradation and of pride, contending with low wants and lofty will, till our mortality predominates. And men are what they name not to themselves and trust not to each other. Hark, the note. Here's a pipe in the distance from a shepherd, the natural music of the mountain reed. For here the patriarchal days are not a pastoral fable. Pipes in the liberal air, mixed with the sweet bells of the sauntering herd. My soul would drink these, those echoes. Oh, that I were the viewless spirit of a lovely sound, a living voice, a breathing harmony, a bodiless enjoyment, born and dying with the blessed tone which made me. So now the chamois hunter comes up, a figure of uh, here a a pastoral ideal. Um, the, uh, the Swiss are famously defenders of a republican government, have a great deal of liberty. This is the land of Calvin and Geneva, and that spreads out through the Reformation uh, as a resistance against tyrannous government of, of the rule of, of, of local uh, churches and families, and uh, there's a, and yet it's a very austere life. It's not a it's not like Switzerland as you now think of it with the with the vast banking structures. It's it's relatively poor, but there's a liberty that's clung to, uh, admired by Byron and his contemporaries. So the chamois hunter, even so this way, the chamois lap. Now a chamois is a type of deer. Her nimble feet have baffled me. My gains today will scarce repay my breakneck travail. What is here? Who seems not of my trade? And yet he hath reached a height which none even of our mountaineers, save our best hunters, may attain. His garb is goodly, his mien manly, and his air 
proud as a freeborn peasant's at this distance, I will approach him nearer. Manfred, not perceiving the other, to be thus gray-haired with anguish like these blasted pines, wrecks of a single winter, barkless, branchless, a blighted trunk upon a cursed root, which but supplies a feeling to decay and to be thus eternally but thus, having been otherwise now furrowed o'er with wrinkles, plowed by moments, not by years, and hours all tortured into ages, hours which I outlive, ye toppling crags of ice, ye avalanches whom a breath draws down in mountainous o'erwhelming, come and crush me. I hear ye momently above, beneath, crash with a frequent conflict, but ye pass, because in the Alps, there's regular avalanches, right? There's instability. There's a sense of, of permanence because of the glaciers of me having been there for since time immemorial, and yet there's a constant uh, threat of imminent death, actually. I hear ye momently above, beneath, uh, no, I just read that, and Hamlet, or the hut of the, and Hamlet of the harmless villager. So the hunter, the mist begin to rise from up the valley. I'll warn him to descend, or he may chance to lose at once his way and life together. The mists boil up around a glacier, the glaciers. Clouds rise curling fast beneath me, white and sulfury. Just like this. Right? Same sort of landscape. Like clouds beneath me. Um, I've lost my way. That was me white and sulfury, like foam from the roused ocean of deep hell, whose every wave breaks on a living shore, heaped with the damned like pebbles. I am giddy. So, Shamal Hunter, I must approach him cautiously. If near, a sudden step will startle him, and he seems tottering already. Mountains have fallen, leaving a gap in the clouds, and with the shock rocking their alpine brethren, filling up the ripe green valleys with destruction splinters, damming with rivers with a sudden dash, which crushed the waters into mist and made their fountains find another channel. Thus, thus in its old age did Mount Rosenberg. Why stood I not beneath it? He wishes to die. So there's a death wish in him as well, uh, which is again characteristic of the romantic hero. He's willing to, uh, his life seems worthless to him and yet defiant, yet resilient. There's this, this again, and you will find that this same uh, death wish, which we see in Manfred, you'll find in all the sort of superheroes that you, um, or figures in Western literature and Western film for that matter, of the, of the, uh, the sort of the rebel policeman, the diehard guy that, you know, all that sort of don't really care, happy to risk life because he doesn't value it, willing to fight for justice, but really has uh, lost any particular reason to live. Um, in, a, in the American context, they, they, they soften him a little bit and give him a, a wife or someone to live for and so forth. But they, that's, that moves against the Byronic. There's no, in the real Byronic here, there is no such a, attachment per se. He's true to himself and that's it. Friend, have a care. Your next step may be fatal. For the love of him who made you, stand not on that brink. Not hearing him, Manfred, should such would have been for me a fitting tomb. My bones had then been quiet in their depth. They had not then been strewn upon the rocks for the wind's pastime as thus. Thus they shall be in this one plunge. Farewell, ye opening heavens. Look not upon me thus reproachfully. Ye were not meant for me. Earth, take these atoms. As Manfred is an act to spring from the cliff, the Shamo hunter, uh, seizes and retains him with a sudden grasp. Hold, madman! 
though a though un, a weary of thy life, stain not our pure veils with thy guilty blood. Away with me, I will not quit my hold. I am most sick at heart. Nay, grasp me not. I am all feebleness. The mountains whirl spinning around me. I grow blind. What art thou? I'll answer that anon. Away with me. The clouds grow thicker. There. Now lean on me. Place your foot here. Here. Take this staff and cling a moment to that shrub. Now give me your hand and hold fast by my girdle. Softly. Well, the, sh the chalet will be gained within an hour. Come on. We'll quickly find a sure footing and something like a pathway which the torrent hath washed since winter. Come, tis bravely done. You should have been a hunter. Follow me. As they descend the rocks with difficulty, the scene closes. Okay, so in the backdrop of this, you want to find types for this. You could see uh, King Lear on the heath being come to the rescue by the fool. Or you could even see Gloucester being rescued by his son Edgar. Remember when he believes that he's about to jump off the cliff? or is induced to believe that he's jumped off a cliff and actually because he's been blinded and, and then he is rescued there. You can see something, I think these are at least in, probably in Byron's mind here, but the end of the first act, let me go back here. Act two. So now we've gone uh, from the, the very dangerous scene at the top of the mountains where uh, Manfred is basically has a will to die and is strong enough. So he's a Nietzschean Ubermensch. He's climbing higher than any man can climb. And he is uh, daring to dare what no man dare. It's a spiritual ascent as much as a physical ascent, defying the spirits. And yet he, he, he does not want power, doesn't desire power. He desires to forget something about himself. He, he just desires oblivion. Not lacking in courage. That's how he's portrayed at any rate. Scene two, a cottage among the Bernese Alps. And the two of them that we left off with still the protagonist. Shamal Hunter, no, no, no. Yet pause, thou must not yet go forth. Thy mind and body are alike unfit to trust each other. For some hours at least. When thou art better, I will be thy guide. But whither? It imports not. I do, I do know my route full well and need no further guidance. Thy garb and gait bespeak thee of high lineage, one of the many chiefs whose castled crags look o'er the lower valleys. Which of, which of these may call thee, Lord? I only know their portals. My way of life leads me but rarely down to bask by the huge earths of those old halls carousing with the vassals. But the paths which step from out our mountains to their doors I know from childhood. Which of these is thine? No matter. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention when I was like, when he earlier expostulated on suffering and wisdom, he's very much speaking in the prophetic tradition or the prophetic tradition, the wisdom tradition of Job and the suffering in there. And he, he sounds like, meditating on the same things that we'll find in Ecclesiastes and, and of Job and of the significance of suffering to human wisdom. And again, so he departs from the first generation of romantics on this. There's something about a lived and, and experienced reality that is not there in Wordsworth. Wordsworth always idealizes out of suffering. Whereas Byron and, and I would say Shelley and Keats uh, lean into suffering and think that there's significance in suffering. And so in this sense, they actually, even though they're the satanic school, are more Christian because they recognize the significance of, of suffering to human character development. I'm not saying that they're Christian. I'm saying that there is at least an awareness of the significance of suffering. And they, they all uh, place a great deal of value on that in a way that the first generation simply does not. I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, no matter, he says. Well, sir, pardon me the question, and be of better cheer. Come, taste my wine. Tis of an ancient vintage. Many a day tis thawed my veins among our glaciers. 
Now let it do thus for thine. Come, pledge me fairly. Away, away, there's blood upon the brim. Will it then never, never sink in the earth? What dost thou mean? Thy senses wander from thee. I say, tis blood, my blood. The pure warm stream which ran in the veins of my fathers and in ours when we were in our youth and had one heart and loved each other as we should not love. And this was shed. But still it rises up, coloring the clouds that shut me out from heaven. Where thou art not, and I shall never be. Man of strange words and some half-maddening sin, which makes thee people vacancy. Whate'er thy dread and sufferance be, there's comfort yet, the aid of holy men and heavenly patience. Patience and patience, hence. That word was made for brutes of burden, not for birds of prey. Preach it to mortals of a dust like thine. I am not of thine order. Thanks to heaven, I would not be of thine for the free fame of William Tell. But whatsoe'er thine ill, it must be borne, and these wild starts are useless. Do I not bear it? Look on me. I live. This is convulsion and no healthful life. I tell thee, man, I have lived many years, many long years, but they are nothing now to those which I must number. Ages, ages, space and eternity and consciousness, which the fierce thirst of death and still unslaked. Why on thy brow the seal of middle age hath scarce been set. I am thine elder far. Thinks thou existence doth depend on time? It doth, but actions are our epochs. Mine hath made my days and nights imperishable, endless and all alike, as sands on the shore innumerable atoms, and one desert, barren and cold, on which the wild waves break, but nothing rests save carcasses and wrecks, rocks and the salt surf, weeds, of bitterness. Alas, he's mad, but yet I must not leave him. I would I were, for then the things I see would be but a distempered dream. What is it thou dost see, or think thou lookst upon? Myself and thee, a peasant of the Alps. Thy humble virtues, hospitable home, and spirit patient, pious, proud, and free, thy self-respect grafted on innocent thoughts, thy days of health and nights of sleep, thy toils by danger dignified, and yet guiltless, hopes of cheerful old age and a quiet grave, with cross and garland over its green turf, and thy grandchildren's love for epitaph. This do I see, and then I look within, it matters not. My soul was scorched already. And wouldst thou then exchange thy lot for mine? No, friend, I would not wrong me, nor exchange my lot with living being. I can bear, however wretchedly, tis still to bear, in life what others could not brook to dream, but perish in their slumber. And with this, this cautious feeling for another's pain, Canst thou be black with evil? Say not so. Can one of gentle thoughts have wreaked revenge upon his enemies? Oh, no, no, no. My injuries come down on those who loved me, on those whom I best loved. I never quelled an enemy. Save in my just defense, my wrongs were all on those I should have cherished but my embrace was fatal. Heaven give thee rest, and penitence restore thee to thyself. My prayers shall be for thee. I need them not, but can endure thy pity. I depart, tis time. Farewell, here's gold. 
and thanks for thee. No words, it is thy due. Follow me not. I know my path. The mountain's perils past. And once again, I charge thee, follow not. Out he goes. Now into the cataracts. So the cataracts are the, uh, the where, where the mountains, the, the sheer mountains fall in the, and the water comes down in spouts and so forth and sounds loud, loudly in the cataract. So you can see that the whole landscape is a sublime landscape throughout. Uh, and we already have a sense of the portrait of Manfred, uh, but it's not abundantly clear in the poem what exactly is ailing him. What is the thing that is bedeviling him? What is the thing he's defying? What's his character? We simply see what he claims it's not. It's not a lust for power. It's not the Faustian character that he is emulating here. It's something else. Anyway, enter Manfred. It is not noon. The sun bows, uh, the sun bows rays still arch the torrent with the many hues of heaven and roll the sheeted silver's waving column o'er the crags headlong perpendicular and fling its lines of foaming light along and to and fro like the pale courser's tail, the giant steed to, to be bestrode by death and told as told in the apocalypse. No eyes but mine now drink this sight of loveliness. I should be sole in this sweet solitude and with the spirit of the place divide the homage of these waters, I will call her. Remember before he saw the image of a woman, a beautiful woman, and sought to embrace her, and then she disappeared just like, and then, <gasps> takes some water in the palm of his hand, flings it with an adjuration, and then after a pause, the witch of the Alps rises beneath the arch of the torrent, like the witch of Endor. beautiful spirit with thy hair of light and dazzling eyes of glory in whose form the charms of earth's least mortal daughters grow to an unearthly stature in an essence of purer elements with the hues of youth carnationed like a sleeping infant's cheek rocked by the beating of her mother's heart or the rose tints which summer's twilight leaves upon thy lofty glaciers, virgin snow, the blush of earth embracing with her heaven, tinge thy celestial aspect um, and make tame the beauties of the sun bow which bends o'er thee. Beautiful spirit in thy calm, clear brow, wherein is glassed serenity of soul, which of itself shows immortality. I read that thou wilt pardon to a son of earth, whom the abstruser powers permit at times to commune with them, if that be, a, if that be he avail him of his spells to call thee thus and gaze on thee a moment. Son of earth, I know thee and the powers of which give thee power. I, need, I know thee for a man of many thoughts and deeds of good and ill extreme in both, fatal and fated in thy sufferings. I have expected this. What wouldst thou with me? To look upon thy beauty. Nothing further. The face of the earth hath maddened me, and I take refuge in her mysteries and pierce to the abodes of those who govern her. But they can nothing aid me. I have sought from them what they could not bestow, and now I search no further. What could be thy quest which is not in the power of the most powerful, the rulers of the invisible? A boon. But why should I repeat it? T'were in vain. I know not that. Let thy lips utter it. Well, though it torture me, tis but the same. My pang shall find a voice. From my youth upwards, my spirit walked not with souls of men nor looked upon the earth with human eyes. The thirst of their ambition was not mine. The aim of their existence was not mine. My joys, my griefs, my passions, and my powers made me a stranger. Though I wore the form, I had no sympathy with breathing flesh. Nor midst the creatures of clay that girded me was there but one who, but of her anon. I said with men, and with the thoughts of men, I held but slight communion, but instead 
My joy was in the wilderness, to breathe the difficult air of the iced mountain's top, where the birds dare not build, nor insects wing flit o'er the herbless granite, or to plunge into the torrent and to roll along on the swift whirl of the new breaking wave of river stream or ocean in their flow. In these my early strength exalted, or to follow through the night the moving moon, the stars in their development, or catch the dazzling lightnings till my eyes grew dim, or to look listening on the scattered leaves uh, while autumn winds were at their evening song. These were my pastimes, and to be alone. For if the beings of whom I was one, hating to be so, crossed me in my path, I felt myself degraded back to them and was all clay again. And then I dived in my lone wanderings to the caves of death, searching uh, its cause in its effect and drew from withered bones and skulls and heaped up dust conclusions most forbidden. Then I passed the nights of years in science untaught, save in the old time, and with time and toil and terrible ordeal and such penance as in itself hath power over the air and spirits that do compass air and earth, space and the peopled infinite, I made mine eyes familiar with eternity, such as before me did the Magi and he who from out their fountain dwellings raised Eros and Anteros at Gadara as I do thee and with my knowledge thirst the thirst of knowledge and the power and joy of this most bright intelligence until proceed. Oh, I but thus prolong my words, boasting these idle attributes, because as I approach the core of my heart's grief, but to my task, I have not named to thee father or mother, mistress, friend or being with whom I wore the chain of human ties. If I had such, they seem not such to me, yet there was one. Spare not thyself, proceed. She was like me in lineaments, in the contours of her face. Hmm. <laughs> you wonder who this is? Her eyes, her hair, her features, all to the very tone even of her voice, they said were like to mine but softened all and tempered into beauty. She had the same lone thoughts and wanderings, the quest of hidden knowledge and a mind to comprehend the universe, nor these alone, but with gentler powers than mine, pity and smiles and tears, which I had not, and tenderness, but that I had for her, humility, and that I never had. Her faults were mine, her virtues were her own. I loved her and destroyed her. With thy hand? Not with my hand, but my heart. <laughs> Dear. It gazed, <laughs> uh, it gazed on mine and withered. I have shed blood, but not hers. And yet her blood was shed. I saw and could not staunch it. And for this, a being of the race, Thou dost despise the order which thine own would rise above, mingling with us and ours. Thou dost forgo the gifts of our great knowledge and shrinks back to recreant mortality? Away. Daughter of air, I tell thee, since that hour, but words are breath. Look on me in my sleep, or watch my watchings. Come and sit by me. My solitude is solitude no more but peopled with the furies. I have gnashed my teeth in darkness till returning morn, then cursed myself till sunset. I have prayed for madness as a blessing. Tis denied me. I have affronted death, but in the war of elements, the waters shrink from me and fatal things passed harmless. The cold hand of an all pitiless demon held me back, back by a single hair which would not break. In fantasy, imagination, all the affluence of my soul, which one day was a Croesus in creation, the richest man in the ancient world, Croesus. I plunge deep, 
but like an ebbing wave, it dashed me back into the gulf of my unfathomed thought. I plunged amidst mankind. Forgetfulness I sought in all. Save there, save where it is to be found. And that I have to learn. My sciences, my long pursuit and superhuman art, immortal here. I dwell in my despair and live and live forever. It may be that I can aid thee. Do this. To do this, thy power must wake the dead or lay me low with them. Do so in any shape, in any hour, with any torture, so it be the last. That is not in my province. But if thou wilt swear obedience to my will and do my bidding, it may help thee to thy wishes. I will not swear. Obey. And whom? The spirits whose presence I command and be the slave of those who served me? Never. Is this all? Hast thou no gentler answer? Yet bethink thee and pause ere thou rejectest. I have said it. Enough. I may retire then. Say, retire. The witch disappears. We are the fools of time and terror. So there's a little bit of a soliloquy here at the end of it all. We are the fools of time and terror. Days steal on us and steal from us. Yet we live, loathing our life and dreading still to die in all the days of a detested yoke. This vital weight upon the struggling heart which sinks with sorrow or beats quick with pain or joy that ends in agony or faintness. In all the days of past and future, for in life there is no present, we can number how few, how less than few were in the soul forbears to pant for death and yet draws back, etc. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I'm going to come to the next scene. So I'm, no way I'm getting through this at this stage. The destinies arise here. Um, and this is at the summit of the mountain. So he's gone back up the mountain. First destinies. Now the destinies are goddesses uh, that, that rule over, the, over the, even the Olympian gods, the fates. The moon is rising broad and round and bright, and here on snows where human foot of common mortal trod we nightly tread and leave no traces or the savage sea the glassy ocean of the mountain ice. Remember, I said there's glaciers and it's just flat, icy, vast. We skim its rugged breakers, which put on the aspect of a tumbling tempest foam, frozen in a moment, a dead whirlpool's image. And this most steep, fantastic pinnacle, the fretwork of some earthquake, where the clouds pause to repose themselves in passing by, is sacred to ourselves to our rebels rather, or our vigils. And here do I await my sisters, for on our way to the hall of Arimanes, for tonight is our great festival. Tis strange they come not. And they hear voices in the destinies and so forth. Let me wait until the hall of Arimanes comes forth. I'll go to the scene four here. Nemesis comes the hall of Arimanes. He's on his throne, a globe of fire, surrounded by the spirits. Hail to our master, prince of earth and air, who walks the clouds and waters. In his hand, the scepter of the elements, which tear themselves to chaos at his high command. He breaketh, and a tempest shakes the ice, the sea. He speaketh, and the clouds reply in thunder. He gazeth, from his glance the sunbeams flee. He moveth, earthquakes rend the world asunder. Beneath his footsteps the volcanoes rise. His shadow is the pestilence. His path the comets herald through the crackling skies. And planets turn to ashes at his wrath. To him war offers daily sacrifice. To him death pays his tribute. Life is his with all its infinite of agonies. And his the spirit of whatever is. Okay, so now the destinies and nemesis appear that were there in the scene before and give glory to him, these dark powers. Bowing down, the destinies that rule and nemesis that is the, uh, at odds with human life, a sort of a curse. So all these are paying obedience, 
showing slavish obedience to Arimanes, the god of the mountains. Enter Manfred. How is Manfred going to respond to the great god Arimanes? What is here? A mortal, thou most rash and fatal wretch, bow down and worship. I do know the man, a, magi a magian of great power and fearful skill. Bow down and worship, slave. What? Knowest thou not thine and our sovereign? Tremble and obey. And all the spirits, prostrate thyself in thy condemned clay, child of the earth, or dread the worst. I know it, and yet ye see I kneel not. Twill be taught thee. Tis taught already. Nay, many a night on the earth, on the bare ground, have I bowed down my face and strewed my head with ashes. I have known the fullness of humiliation, for I sunk before my vain despair and knelt to my own desolation. Dost thou dare refuse to Arimanes on his throne what the whole earth accords, beholding not the terror of his glory? Crouch, I say. Bid him bow down to that which is above him, the overruling infinite, the maker who made him not for worship. Let him kneel and we will kneel together. Crush the worm, tear him in pieces. So, as I say, the <laughs> typical, um, typical uh, scene of defiance. So we have Arimanes, the spirit of that inhabits the mountain, uh, a natural, uh, sort of a deus, deus trope of um, the sublimity, and he won't bow to it, insists that it bow to him, because of course the sublime is a creation of his imagination, and he claims power over it, and over infinity, etc. So they're all after him. What doth he hear then? Let him answer that. Ye know what I have known, and without power I could not be amongst ye. But there are powers deeper still beyond. I come in quest of such to answer unto what I seek. What wouldst thou? Thou canst not reply to me. Call up the dead. My question is for them. Great Aramanes doth thy will avouch the wishes of this mortal? Yea. <laughs> Whom wouldst thou uncharnal? One without a tomb. Call up Astarte. So Astarte, I mean, I'm going to have to come back to this next time. Astarte, who is Astarte? Do you recall who Astarte is? That might be one for homework. Um, Babylonian goddess um, whose uh, Greek equivalent you will certainly know. I'll just leave it at that for real. There's homework. I'll leave you with that, and we'll pick it up le next time with uh, this section. So I'll finish Manfred, and then we'll move on uh, to uh, the next poem, but we'll leave it at that for now. I'll leave you